projects who are joining us this morning who are going to be uh, hearing about and sharing their experience of their work uh, the support that they've received indeed from the CES team, my colleagues who are here this morning also. So I'd like to, to thank them. Um, and I know for many of the people today, it's an, it's an emotional day because there's been such relationships and support built up between all of those involved. Um, I suppose ultimately though, this is a, a project that has brought about a huge contribution um, to the field of family uh, and support. And well, we're very hopeful that that efforts will come to, um, to bear in relation to future development of the sector, uh, where we can share those lessons and, and strengthen the sector as it goes forward. I think has has been probably understood, this is a significant contribution for Northern Ireland evidence in particular. Um, so we really do value that. I think finally, we are conscious that this event specifically is about sort of creating a, the next journey for the reaching out supporting families and um, evidence generated. And we're really keen to ensure that the lessons that are learned are, are shared with the wider policy community um, and indeed practitioners and families from further afield. So we really hope the event can, can start that sharing and that narrative that has been generated. Finally, I would just like to thank um, the 36 groups who've been participant in the five year journey um, for their absolutely amazing contribution and their very generous sharing of their um, experiences. I want to thank the staff and the volunteers who've also been involved. And finally, just to say really enjoy the day and really look forward to hearing about it myself. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Inez. So as Inez has said, this day is really a huge part of this day is about learning and what, what we're learning from the Reaching Out Supporting Families program. But first, we're going to hear more about what difference the program made to families in Northern Ireland. Reaching Out to Supporting Families in Northern Ireland. 36 projects, five years, one goal. What happens when you make a commitment to families in Northern Ireland for five years? In 2014, the National Lottery Community Fund began to invest £25 million in 36 projects for a period of five years. The projects worked with different groups in different ways, but all of them had one single goal, to support families in Northern Ireland. CES was commissioned to support the learning and evaluation of the programme. Projects were aimed at families experiencing challenges in their lives. They aimed to address the mental and physical well-being of families, families in crisis, economic and or educational empowerment of families, families marginalised in wider society. The aim of the Reaching Out Supporting Families programme was to support families across Northern Ireland to improve their children's lives by building strong and nurturing relationships. We ran learning and networking events, masterclasses and hands-on workshops for the 36 projects to help them implement their projects. These covered themes such as engaging parents, trauma-informed practice, hearing the child's voice, storytelling, digital media, partnership working, project implementation and evaluation. The National Lottery Community Fund also asked us to capture learning from the programme and to share this learning with policymakers and services. So, what happened? What happened is that families experienced increased confidence, enhanced well-being and reduced isolation. Increased confidence. What does that mean for families? Families said that they experienced higher levels of self-esteem Parents and children generally feeling better about and within themselves. One of the parents attending a drop-in session said, Our son completed the whole event and was in attendance every week, which is an achievement in itself as he has never had the ability or confidence to do so before. Increased confidence in their parenting or caring role, including a better understanding of their child's needs and strategies to address those needs. Increased social confidence including the ability to seek out support and engage with education. What does enhanced well-being look like for families? 
Firstly, improve relationships between children and parents, as well as other family relationships, better communication, and a greater sense of trust. Families reported an increased ability to cope, including reduced levels of stress and anxiety. Part in one of the projects said, if something is upsetting me, I wait until she, project worker, comes back into school as she is not here all the time. When she is not here, she has told us how to cope, smell in the strawberries and blow out the candle. These breathing exercises help us and make you feel calmer. They have reported having better health, both physical and mental. And in what ways are families less isolated? They are building relationships, making new friendships and rebuilding old ones. They are using the support of others with similar experiences. Shared experiences help families to feel less isolated because they feel supported when they share their experiences and knowledge in a safe space. One of the parents said, It is so good to be able to sit and talk to other adults looking at strategies to handle anxiety, meltdowns and challenging behaviour. It is just so good knowing that you don't have to explain yourself to anybody. As the Reaching Out Supporting Families programme comes to an end, families also have increased knowledge of where to find other help and the confidence to ask for it. To find out more about the programme, visit effectiveservices.org. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And if you'd like to watch it again at some stage after the conference, we'll circulate the link uh, and you'll also be able to see it on the CES website over the next couple of days. Of course, the Reaching Out Supporting Families programme couldn't have happened without the funding and support from the National Lottery Community Fund in Northern Ireland. And I'm really delighted to introduce our next speaker, Sandra McNamee. Sandra is a board member with the National Lottery Community Fund in Northern Ireland. And Sandra, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Neve. Um, good morning, everyone. It's absolutely wonderful to be here. And uh, I really enjoyed watching that animation. What a wonderful start to the day. And um, so thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Magella and the team at CES here uh, for inviting me to be part of this significant conference. I'm absolutely delighted to be here to represent the National Lottery Community Fund. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the difference the Reaching Out Supporting Families programme is making, and both from the perspective of practitioners and also from families as well. Uh, Reaching Out Supporting Families was a long-term investment of 25 million by the National Lottery Community Fund. And this funding, which was made possible thanks to National Lottery players, has supported 36 projects across Northern Ireland who are working with families with a child under the age of 12 to help them through a range of adversities. First and foremost this morning, I'd like to pay tribute to everyone um, involved in the 36 projects for their vision, uh, their passion and their commitment to making a difference for families. And I'd especially like to mention all the families who have helped shape the projects that we will hear about today. From the outset, we at the National Lottery Community Fund wanted to support a range of projects that would make a real and lasting difference for families facing adversity. We wanted to see parents more involved in their children's learning. We wanted to see reduced isolation and we wanted to see stronger relationships for families. Each of the 36 projects is so different um, in terms of purpose, activities and approaches, but all share that common purpose of being there for families when they need them. Um, difficulties that some of the families have experienced include disability and health issues, trauma, poverty, stigma, exclusion and isolation. And these are just some of the challenges faced by families in Northern Ireland on a daily basis. The projects have told us that these adversities, some of which are initially hidden, become more complex when they're combined with other difficulties. And this is really where the true value of partnership can be recognised, when different organisations join together, share their knowledge and specialisms to really create more positive outcomes for a family. So it will come as no surprise to you all then that partnership working was really one of the programme's musts for us 
And we really wanted to see progressive developments developed and nurtured. And speaking now uh, in 2021, I really have to congratulate each project on how you have embraced this theme of partnership. You have created and cultivated innovative partnerships with voluntary organizations and statutory agencies. And at the heart of these formal and sometimes informal collaborations is the best interest of the families that you work with. And this may have meant bringing together four organizations or 14 organizations, each with a part to play. Uh, the importance of flexibility, I think, has also really been highlighted through the learning, and we're going to hear more about that today. Um, we know that families are so diverse and the issues that they face are so diverse. And I think learning from this programme really, really tells us that when it comes to family support, there really isn't a one size fits all approach. What families really need is flexible, practical, social and emotional support. Different families have different needs and these needs will change with time. And I read with interest that one project stated the presenting issue was never what the actual issue was. Some projects have provided support in the family home, while others have used community development approaches, but all are learns to overcome adversity, bring families together to learn and help families to feel more connected to their community. Through the programme's flexibility, projects have been able to try out different approaches and test and learn along the way. And this has allowed them to achieve the best possible outcomes for the families that they work with. Um, I have been so proud to be the committee lead for this programme, and I've had the privilege of visiting eight out of the 36 projects. And this has provided me with a wonderful opportunity to have conversations um, with those organisations who are delivering the activities, but also with the families who have been supported. And I can look back and remember all of these visits with great clarity. And each time I came away amazed by the passion of staff and um, the resilience of families and the power of partnerships to create real and lasting change for families. And for me, uh, this is definitely one of the highlights of being a committee member. One of my last visits was to the South Tyrone Empowerment Programme. And this wasn't long before our landscapes changed completely with the advent of COVID-19. And on this particular visit, I was really struck to hear directly from the parents about the difference the project was making on their families, especially those from ethnic minority communities. This project was really helping families to build their resilience and to strengthen those relationships within the community. I met with parents who had completed the Incredible Years programme and I was able to hear from them firsthand how positively it had impacted on so many areas of their lives. And these conversations are invaluable. And again, I'm really looking forward to hearing today more about these experiences and about the aspirations and the ideas of everybody involved. Uh, before I close, I'd like to say a wee bit about where we at the National Lottery Community Fund are with our planning for the future. And we are really excited to be starting to plan for how our portfolio will look after next year. We have made a commitment to keep all our main programmes open until the end of next year. So that is our awards for all people and communities and empowering young people. And we believe this will offer reassurance and stability and certainty to communities and to the sector. We know the last year has been incredibly tough for so many, and we've been so impressed by the resilience, the compassion, and the leadership of the groups that we are so proud to support. Over the next year, we will be reviewing and refreshing our current funding programmes and planning for our portfolio post-2022, but we will take a transitional approach to this, ensuring that we understand the new and emerging needs while our programmes continue to offer flexibility. And of course, we will continue to listen when groups tell us what matters most to them in their communities. As I said at the start, reaching out supporting families was a long-term investment for us, and our projects have used it to completely transform the lives of so many families. And we as a funder couldn't be prouder of what has been achieved. 
It was also an opportunity for us to invest in a programme of learning and evaluation through the wonderful expertise of CES. And in closing, I really want to pay tribute to Magella and her wonderful team on the how they have worked diligently, bringing together the 36 projects to consider the components needed for good family support. Components like working in partnership with families, adopting a whole family approach, prioritizing early intervention and prevention, and empowering families and encouraging peer support. I'd also like to take the opportunity to congratulate CES on their comprehensive approach to capturing the learning, evidencing impact, and sharing that powerful legacy which we are hearing about today. The conference today is Rethinking Family Support, Building Connections to Strengthen Families, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussions that will increase our learning, challenge our thinking, and enable us to explore this in more depth. And I know it's going to be an absolutely wonderful event, so thank you. Thanks very much, Sandra. And I think you've set us up very well uh, for the discussions that, that we're going to have this morning. So now we have in attendance two ministers from the Northern Ireland Executive. Um, and I, I think it shows how much they value the programme and the organisations involved to take the time to be with us today. They are Minister De Declan Kearney and Minister Gary Middleton. And I'm going to start by inviting Minister Declan Kearney to say a few words. Well, my my is Steve, Margin Y, Dave, or Margin. I guess it's Kush Ahas do, Avela Galier and you. I guess it's in the Tawakta and Keshaw at Tasar Gore or Margin. Tasha Rehawakta the Yas or Sahi or Fad. I guess it's Asian, Chilach, Kesh and Chile. I guess on Tawakta one is Lataki at the Horch the Haile. I guess in yoga. Yes, the dar sahi agus dar bubble gagachina. Good morning, everybody. It's a, a real pleasure to join you today, uh, and it's great to have the opportunity to discuss with all of you uh, at the start of your event something that I believe is absolutely central to the well-being of our society, and and that, of course, is family, and the importance of families and young people being supported to thrive within our community and how we can build resilience into the infrastructure of family as a central cog of community life. And, and that's what Reaching Out Supporting Families program has sought to do. This isn't a theoretical issue. In, in my own personal family experience, we have and we continue to deal with a, a multiplicity of issues, autism, eating disorders, mental health and well-being challenges for younger members of my family and uh, younger adults, PTSD. And uh, therefore, when, when you consider that, uh, and you consider uh, that that is a characteristic of so many families, then I, I think it allows us to reflect then with the chance that you're providing today on the really wonderful work that's been done through this programme. What's worked well? the positive effect that it has had on families and importantly, how we can learn from and then build on all of those different experiences and the responses uh, that will allow us to move forward together because no two families are the same. And there's no doubt that family life presents many challenges and I've just given you an insight to you know, some of the issues that, uh, that I have seen within my own wider family circle uh, in the past and in the present day. And, and I know that that is all too true of so many families within our society. So we all do uh, appreciate the impact of disability, of trauma, poverty, discrimination, and isolation. And that has a disproportionate effect on our young people. It has a negative effect on adults and older adults, younger adults. But when it has an impact upon younger people in their formative years, then that can have a consequence for the, the future life cycle. And inevitably the pandemic has uh, deepened all of those challenges as we've been restricted in our ability to access each other, to meet in person and to work as effectively as we would have wanted. So supporting families through 
and helping them to overcome periods of adversity is really vital work. And I want to commend the efforts of everybody who's been involved in this process, especially the many voluntary and community organizations who have worked so hard to support those who are in most need within our communities. And, and that's identifying the actual challenges and difficulties, but also anticipating the hidden challenges and difficulties. The success stories from this program demonstrate the clear need to develop innovative solutions to deliver services at grassroots level for families and young people in particular who are living with that type of adversity. And sometimes it will appear that the system has failed us. And sometimes indeed the system has indeed failed us where families and young people are perhaps pushed from what seems to be pillar to post in relation to trying to get the type of supports and interventions that they require in order to flourish as adults. And that's why partnership working is so important and why I listened intently and agreed with much of what Sandra said. We need to find flexibility and partnership, which allows us to both engage and also to intervene with many of the mental and health and well-being issues that we have to deal with, but also the structural issues that affect our society in terms of inequality, racial inequality, sectarianism, and many of the intolerances that can create division and perpetuate division in our society. So as we take this opportunity to look forward and to share the significant learning experiences from this particular program, I think it's clear that we can do the best for people and our young people particularly going forward by working in partnership and through co-design approaches. That's what will help us to support and empower people and neighborhoods in the most effective way. And that partnership approach is at the very core of our emerging program for government. And the executive has engaged widely to help form and deliver a vision of improved well-being for all families within our community. And just by way of an update, the public consultation on the draft program for government outcomes framework has taken place and a total of 416 responses were provided to the main consultation. And in addition, there were 23 responses to an associated children and young people's consultation. I think that's really important to note. We as a power sharing government are committed to bringing forward a final and a revised version of the uh, outcomes framework to the executive as soon as possible. And that will then obviously be brought into uh, engagement and discussion within wider society. So to finish, I want to say congratulations. Well done to you all. Everybody who has been involved in reaching out and supporting families and it has been really heartening to hear thus far and to note from your, uh, your video clip earlier about the positive effect that, are, that is felt by families who have engaged in this process. I think it's also important to acknowledge the financial support of the National Lottery Community Fund, clearly without whose assistance the programme would not have been able to exist. And thank you, of course, finally, Morocco Scar, to the Centre for Effective Services for hosting today's conference and helping to make sure that we can all share learning to achieve better outcomes for everyone, and particularly our young people into the future. So thank you all very much this morning. Thank you very much, Declan. And I'm now going to invite Minister Gary Middleton to say a few words. Good morning, and, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here today, albeit virtually. Uh, but I'm uh, very much looking forward to taking part in the conference and hearing uh, a lot of the contributions which will be taking place. So I just want to start by adding my thanks to all of the organisations that run the projects and um, all of those organisations which have made the Reaching Out Supporting Families programme such a success. And of course, for making a difference to the lives of many families within our communities. Uh, this programme initially set out to help families develop the skills and the tools uh, to help them to overcome adversity, uh, to come together to learn, uh, but also to be part uh, of the community that they live in. These three 
outcomes very much lie at the heart of the three of the key themes for citizens in our programme for government, uh, where children have the best start in life. Uh, we also have an equal and inclusive society, and we have a caring society that supports people through their lives, particularly in times of adversity. The learning paper very much encapsulates the ethos of the programme for government, which recognises the need to listen to people, uh, to listen to people within our communities, using their experiences, of course, to shape the delivery of services to improve outcomes and well-being for all. The paper clearly sets out the complexity and the range of issues that many families face on a daily basis right across our communities, whether that be through poverty, trauma, disability, uh, discrimination, or whether that be exclusion. Any one of these would be a challenge for a family to deal with, but when issues are compounded, it is very easy to see why families often don't know where to turn to, to first to seek help. I was very much delighted to see the improvements that families reported experiencing, including enhanced well-being, leading to better family relationships and health, and indeed reduced isolation. With the development of friendships and connections to the community, bringing a sense of shared experience for those who were receiving support. There was also increased confidence with the programme cited as not only serving to help boost the self-esteem of parents and children, but also to have improved social confidence in seeking support and engaging in education. Indeed, under each of these high level themes, no doubt there are numerous stories of personal successes. So in order to address these inequalities that exist within and between our communities, it is vital that we work with one another to empower both individuals and local communities to bring about positive change. As an executive, we wish to see an inclusive society in which people of all ages and backgrounds are respected and indeed supported. A society without barriers where people live prosperous and fulfilling lives and where everyone can reach their full potential. Providing our children with the best start in life lays the foundations for their health and well-being. So just in conclusion, I want to thank you once again for inviting myself and Declan along today. I commend the work of this programme and look forward to seeing the future benefits it brings to both the families and the communities that we all live in. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gary. And again, on behalf of everyone here, thanks to both of you for joining us. And I think the organisations here can take huge encouragement from your words of support. Thanks to both of you. Now, many of you here will know that CES has been working with organisations involved in the programme since it started six years ago, capturing their learning about supporting families in their communities. Dr. Jennifer Hanratty is a project specialist with CES, and Jennifer is going to share some of that learning with you now. Thanks, Neve, and thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Good morning, all. Um, it's so lovely to see so many um, familiar faces here. Um, as Neve said, that CES has been working for the last number of years to capture the learning from the Reaching Out Supporting Families program directly um, from the organisations themselves and, and from the funder. And I want to just take a moment to say thank you to everyone who took the time to speak to us to share your evaluation reports and um, for me coming into the project and um, towards the end it was an absolute pleasure and um, to hear from all of you and hear about the great work that you've been doing over the last number of years um, and have you you've heard already um, the headlines here that we have um, from capturing the learning on what we what have we learned about good family support well we know now that good family support is needs led um, it acknowledges and addresses the adversities that families are facing. And it does this by adopting what we see as five core approaches. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail um, on each of these points. So looking first at needs led. So we understand that different families have different needs. And as children grow and change and develop, the family circumstances change, the needs of the families will change. So the cross-cutting message around family needs is that it cannot be a one size fits all approach. And we also saw that it takes time and it takes effort to understand what families need for the needs of families to emerge as they learn to trust the services and build relationships with them. And then that enables a service to be flexible, to build a service that is flexible enough to meet the needs of families as they emerge and as they change. And this is just a selection of some of the needs that the programmes told us that the families they serve had. And they fell into three general categories. Degrees. So first of all, we have practical needs. So those are the very basic human needs like food, housing, 
heat transport and financial help um, but also help to engage with other services and understand how to navigate the services and um, that they needed to access when we look at support, we're talking about social support um, for the families to enable them to connect with other families that are similar to themselves, but also to connect with their wider community. And that social support was needed for, for families, for parents, but also for, for children to have connection with peers that are similar to them. And then we have the emotional needs of the families and um, they need help and support while they're maybe waiting for access to higher tier services. And also organisations found that there was a need for higher level services for mental health. And um, some organisations were focused on providing support for mental health, but many really were not expecting the level of need around mental health that they saw um, in the families that they were working with. And we've heard already about some of the adversities that families were facing and um, that the, the Reaching and Supporting Families programme were supporting. Um, families were dealing with multiple and often intersecting adversities. And there is a complex and interconnected relationship between adversity and its action on each member of the family and the family the whole. So the adversities might not just add up in a linear way to cause poor outcomes for families and individual children, but instead that they can amplify and fuel each other. And unfortunately, we did find that for some organisations, families told them that difficulty in accessing appropriate services and support in a timely manner was identified as an additional adversity in itself, and particularly by those projects working to support families affected by poor health or disability. And organisations told us that the bureaucracy and the difficulty in accessing the services and supports the families need added to their stress when trying to, to navigate the, the help and support that they needed. And when we look at the, the data, we see that there were five key approaches that emerged um, in terms of what good family support actually looks like. Um, in the projects that we spoke to, they reflected um, on how they adopted a whole family approach and the importance of working in partnership with families, the um, importance of early intervention and prevention in empowering families. And then there was a, a, a key uh, information on, on peer support and the importance of that in contributing to supporting families. Um, and all of these approaches were reflected in the wider evidence base on family support and what makes for good family support. So it's not just what the organizations and what the families here were telling us, this is reflected in the existing knowledge base on what the good family support looks like. So I'll take you through each of these approaches. So first of all, a whole family um, approach. What we mean there is that we're trying to look at the family as a whole to identify how the family can be supported most effectively. So in this context, it means that projects could see the family as an entire unit and not just individual parents or offering supports to individual children. And as one organization put it, when families are only seen for bits of themselves, there's nowhere where it all comes together. And a whole family approach considers what supports the whole family unit needs to support better outcomes for the children and for the family overall. And you can see some of the quotes there from the families that illustrate how important that is to them. In terms of early intervention and prevention, it means putting supports in place early in a child's life, but also intervening early in the genesis of a problem. So when you see that a problem is starting to emerge, that supports are put in place at that point to prevent families getting into a crisis situation. And it's very well established in the literature and the wider evidence base that early intervention and prevention works and that it's less costly. It's less costly in terms of how much it costs to invest in services to support families and, and to intervene to prevent poor outcomes. But it's also less costly in the personal costs to the family and to the child and society to reduce that potential for suffering for families before they get into a crisis um, situation. Um, but as I mentioned before, we found that under-resourced services and expanding needs within the community it made sticking to early intervention for the, pro for the programs that were focused on early intervention and prevention, it made sticking to early intervention and prevention difficult. So what I mean there is that when families were unable to access a higher level of support that they needed when they needed it, the community and voluntary organizations tended to try to extend their services to pick up families that couldn't access the statutory services that they needed. And that in turn, limited the community and voluntary organizations ability to do the early intervention work that they set out to do. And 
There were some exceptional examples of partnership between community and voluntary sector and statutory sector agencies. And these partnerships were characterized by mutual understanding and respect, and that enabled both partners to do their individual and unique role better. And that allowed families to move seamlessly between uh, different services in terms of the level of need that they had. And it also helped to stop families falling through the gap between the early intervention services and the crisis services and enabled both partners to stick with doing what they do best and allow the community and voluntary sector to focus on the early intervention and prevention and um, that they were set, setting out to achieve. And the last three approaches I've put together um, because they all are linked and much like adversities contribute to a vicious cycle for families, these positive approaches can contribute to a virtuous cycle. And all of these different approaches underline the importance, the vital importance of relationships, relationships between families and services, relationships within families and between families and their peers um, for parents and for children. And so first to partnership. So the clear message here from projects was that investing time and effort in building and maintaining relationships with families allowed the families to feel safe and trust the organization. Those relationships were then the foundation of actually being able to support families. First in enabling families to feel safe so that they could open up and tell projects what it was that they really needed. And that then allowed projects to learn how to design or how to deliver services that the families actually needed that they would engage with. And for some projects, those relationships enabled genuine co-design of the services offered, a true partnership between families and organisations. But for many organisations, the co-design wasn't actually a feature of the work at the beginning of the project. They came to the programme thinking that they, they knew what was needed, that they had the solution, and their task was to just get on and deliver that solution. But actually, the reality turned out to be quite different um, for a lot of organisations and that projects quickly learned that they needed to invest time in working with families and building those relationships so that they could really get to the core of what families need, needed and then provide that support for them. For some organisations, this learning meant that they needed to change what services they actually offered. For others, they changed how they went about delivering the services. And for some, it was both. And the key was that flexibility on the part of the organisations and on the part of the funder was essential to facilitating that genuine co-design with families so that they could change and respond to what families actually needed. And the second point on partnership is that families and services need to work together in order to support the children. So this comes back to the whole family approach. And in working to engage families respectfully, without judgment or without speaking down to them, families are more ready and able to work with services. So in some cases, this work might actually be quite challenging to the family, challenging the family to change or to develop new skills and understandings, challenging the parents to look at themselves and understanding what they need rather than only focusing on the child. And those strong and trusting relationships between services and families facilitates that challenging work so that the service and family can work in partnership together to improve outcomes for the child and for the family as a whole. And looking then at empowering families, that was a really strong theme that emerged in, in the data. And it reflected the wider evidence base as well. But in the wider evidence base, there's a tendency to talk about a strengths-based approach which is not quite the same as empowering families, but it's very much related. Um, essentially, it's a focus on building up the families and their strengths rather than fixing the deficits or fixing the problems with the family. So projects approach to empowerment in different ways. For example, they offer training and education for parents to equip them with skills and knowledge. They offered emotional support and understanding for families and working to build or to rebuild parents' confidence in their role and their abilities as parents. And this was also linked to partnership because in some cases, by facilitating opportunities for families to contribute to projects as advisors or, or as co-designing partnership, that further empowered families where they felt that they were really valuable to the service in terms of being able to help to support the service to do better, to then support more families. Um, and another important way that families and parents were empowered was through peer support and being able to offer support to others. So peer support can offer a range of benefits. 
Um, it can be a source of social connection, as we've already heard, combating that sense of isolation. And peers can act as a normalizing influence. And what I mean there is that when your child is different or your family circumstances are different from the other families or the other people around you, it can feel very isolating. And peers provide that sense of normality and connection to others that have the same or similar experiences to you. And to offer that all important emotional support and, and who better really to offer that genuine understanding and empathy than people who have the same experience as you or have overcome the same challenges that you're currently facing. So peers can serve as a trusted source of information. Um, and for those families or those parents who become peer leaders, the process of then giving back and helping others further contributes to helping to build their confidence and empower them. So peer support also has the potential to be self-sustaining with new friendships and new connections that continue outside of the service. But one thing to really understand here is that this sort of peer support doesn't just happen. So peer groups where there was training and support offered to peer leaders were more successful and more likely to be sustained over a longer period of time um, than those peer supports that were kind of expected to just organically emerge so actually investing and in supporting that peer support process um, is quite important. So just to recap, what does good family support look like? We can see that it is needs led. Um, it acknowledges and addresses the adversities and the multiple adversities that families are facing. And it adopts five key approaches of a whole family approach, partnership with families, early intervention and prevention, working to empower families and offering a source of peer support. Um, you can read more about the learning in more detail um, in the full learning paper. Um, but I also just want to say um, thank you to everybody who um, contributed and took the time to, to speak to us. Um, and we hope that we have adequately reflected um, the amazing learning that, you, that the organizations and the projects have developed over the last number of years. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, and just to mention that we'll also at some stage uh, in the next couple of days, we'll make Jennifer's slides available. People are probably keen to have another look at those. And a reminder that the paper is already up. There is a learning paper already up on the CES website. And I understand plenty more uh, resources to come. Just also mention that the chat is starting to pick up. So there's we're hearing quite a lot of uh, information this morning. And if you do have a question um, that 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 you want that, that you want addressed, we can do that through the chat. So do uh, feel free to comment or, or pop your question in there. So families in Northern Ireland have been at the heart of the reaching out supporting families ever since it started. Now it's time for us to meet the families. In the next video segment, you're going to hear from some of the families who benefited from the programme. In accordance with the wishes of the families involved, voiceovers were recorded by members of the CES team, but the words are very much theirs. So I think we have a, we should have a video clip now. Yeah, great. Families told us about their experience of adversity prior to receiving support from the Reaching Out Supporting Families programme. They told us, we felt lost, isolated and unsupported. I was suffering from really bad depression. I just didn't see a light at the end of the tunnel. Because of my daughter's health issues, I spent a lot of years feeling isolated at home, protecting her. And then when she had the stroke, I felt like I was banging my head against a brick wall. I feel the whole family needed support. I didn't always feel it was there until Bolster became part of our lives. It wasn't there. Quite literally, it wasn't there. At the start of our journey with her, you kind of don't want to be a burden on people and you don't know what to ask for. You don't know what's available. It's completely, at the start you find you're in a dark tunnel with no torch and you've no idea what resources are available or who's out there to help or what to ask for, you know. Help from the Reaching Out Supporting Families programme has added quality to our life. It's just been a good help for us, you know. 
in terms of, I suppose, adding quality to your life. Because I know people look at me and think, God, I can do what you do and all this. And I'm kind of thinking my life isn't all that bad. We have a great quality of life now. It's different, but with all the support, it's opened up our horizons to so much more opportunities. To meet amazing families, to meet people who want to help, to chat to people who've been in similar situations to us. And just to get out there and enjoy family days. And it's great, like, I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't say I wouldn't have gone to one of their family days. It wasn't beneficial. I think everything we've taken part in has been really good, to be honest, and they make it easy. We can't always do the things that we want to do as a family, you know. So for my younger wee man to be able to say, OK, do you know what? They're running this summer scheme. I know he will be in the best place. He'll have great friends. He'd be incredibly well looked after. And he has had some fantastic, fantastic days because of that, that I would not have been able to give him otherwise. He's not missing out on being a youngster because of the challenges that are within our family at this minute in time, you know, and that's definitely down to bolster, definitely. And even like from the point of even learning how to play with my child, I feel so much more confident. My confidence has rose massively from Sense's help. Having some place you can go that you can talk to somebody you know, you just don't feel as isolated. The sessions made me feel in lockdown that somebody really, really cared. Cared about our daughter, cared about us as a family, and really were trying to help us move forward. Reflecting on their experiences of accessing support, families told us, we need to know that it's okay to ask for help. They taught me that it's all right to say that. It's all right to say that I'm struggling. I need help. And you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. And you know, don't be afraid to put yourself out there because it's not just you. It's for the benefit of my daughter and for everybody else, the whole family circle. I always felt I've got this, I've got this totally under control. Everything's great. And then when I had a bump in the road, it really kind of floored me to be honest because I wasn't controlling it and I wasn't, I was really struggling but I was struggling to ask for help. We need services to take a holistic whole family approach to offering support. One sick child has a humongous backlash and ripple effect on the entire family and obviously a child that was as ill as my child is and was even worse at that time prior to medication and prior to any support. A child that is that ill, you know the whole family is in need of support. We need access to timely support. I think possibly had more support been put in place earlier it would have been, I'm not going to say it would have been easier, but it would have taken a lot of the pressures away. Life is just, you're looking down the barrel for gun. And I think in terms of all services, you know, it should be given to you at the start, I think. You shouldn't have to go looking for it as much as we had to. We value peer support. It just, it took away that sense of feeling alone, you know, that we were the only people in the world going through what we were going through. And it's just nice to know that other people, it was good for me to know that other people were struggling too. That was a big thing for me, you know, when I realised, God, this is quite normal and it's quite normal to feel like that. That in itself helped. To be able to go somewhere where you don't have to explain yourself or you don't have to, you know, everybody was going along probably. And I'm not saying that they would have been in a similar boat to us, but they all had their own difficulties at home. And it was just, it was just a space where you could just go and be yourself without having to worry about trying to explain yourself or explain why you might possibly have needed to run away quick if you got a phone call or, you know, it was just that safe space that you could just be there. We need information, advice and support to help us navigate a complex landscape of disjointed services and supports. It just was a very easy gradual pathway that they made it. Just, it was seamless. There was no issues. You asked and you, they gave you any information that you needed and they nearly anticipated what you would need. And that I suppose is something that, that's what they're good at. Because they could say, look, you know your child is complex. We deal with so many kids with complexities. 
We know what will be good for you as a mum. They knew exactly what we would need. And I didn't know what I would need. Her dad didn't know what we would need, but they knew exactly what we would want. I think the resources there should be very well laid out, maybe online or just a contact person working maybe in a non-profit organisation or working in the NHS or working in the hospital. A social worker even could come out maybe at the start and just go through what's there just to give you that blanket of support that you know you can avail of if you want to, you know, because the resources came to us because I had researched. Services should be proactive in reaching out to families. You're going through so much every day with your complex child and our daughter won't feed herself. She can't do anything for herself, basically. And as I said, things can turn dark in an instant. You know, we can end up in A&E, we could end up in ICU. You don't have time to be scrolling through leaflets. It's a spectrum. It's not just about disabilities. It's about people who experience mental health issues or there's just such a ream of things. The last thing some people want is to be a burden and you've people that will know exactly what to do with the system. And you've other people then that just don't know what to do. And it's those people that may look like they're doing great in life, but deep down, you know, they could be suffering massively because they're afraid to ask for help, or they feel like, oh, I wouldn't be entitled to that. You know, and it's not about being entitled, it's about availing of services that could massively benefit your life. We need professionals and services to work together in taking a coordinated approach to offering support. I'm sure I'm not the only person in Northern Ireland this has happened to. There's a bit missing there somewhere along the line in communication where the hospital should have been able to say to brain injury matters, look, we've got a family here and there's going to be long roads ahead. There's a big missing part there. Maybe that's the best way of putting it. I feel really strongly about this because I would hate to think that. I would feel so devastated for another mother to feel the way I was feeling. Services should be family led. They allowed me to set my own goals and my own targets rather than them setting them for me. So I was basically only doing what I had said myself that I wanted to do and they were just aiding me along. They were holding my hand along the way and guiding me in the right direction. So on that note, I think it's a really good time for us to take a break. So we're going to break now for about 10 minutes, which will bring us back at about 20 to 11. So 10.40, we're going to restart. So feel free to turn your camera off, stretch, have a cup of tea or do whatever you need to do to take a break. And we'll see you again shortly. Goodbye. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. <laughs> I hope you got the opportunity to get out of your chair during that 10 minutes. Maybe grab a cup of tea. I hope not everybody succumbed to checking their emails. Um, I'm just going to introduce you now to um, Jade Irwin, Shauna Garvin from Step Up, Step Down, Heather Floyd and Cahill O'Doherty from Moving Up, Moving On, and Louise O'Kane and Debbie Williams um, from Family First Project at Women's Aid. And I am going to ask them, they're going to be, they're all going to be spotlighted. It's just you at the moment, Cahill. All going to be spotlighted so that you can see them. And um, I am going to ask them to introduce themselves. I'm just waiting for them to come up on the screen here. Here we go. You're coming in. Hi, Jade. Jade, as you're the first one spotlighted, I'm going to pick on you first um, for you and Shauna to give us two minutes on your project and your partnership. Certainly. Um, I'm happy to kick off first. Mm -hmm. So uh, our project is Step Up, Step Down, and it's a partnership between the Fostering Network, and that's who I work for, and the Southeastern Health and Social Care Trust, where Shauna is from. Um, and the, the true partnership really is between us and of course the families and their wider communities. So it's a pleasure to work on this project, like it's a real joy. And the idea is that we are 
working with families that would be on the periphery of care and we can talk more later about what that actually means um, and we step up when families require some additional support and then we step down whenever they have the tools and resources to continue on themselves and the beauty of this uh, program is that family support foster carers are fostering the whole family so it's a really mm. innovative use of foster care and an exciting role for them Shauna, I'm sure you have something great to add. <laughs> Thanks, Jade. I know you've mentioned it all. I suppose I've, I've always felt the privilege to work on this scheme. I really love the fact that it has been a partnership between the Southeastern Trust and the Foster Network. Um, I think we were the first in Northern Ireland to do this type of work where we used existing experienced foster carers within the Southeastern Trust, who then took on the role to mentor and work alongside the parents. In essence, they do walk alongside our families on the edge of care. It is a complete journey. They work very intently with them, provide emotional support, practical support. All the elements that were mentioned earlier on the presentation, our scheme encompasses all of that. And, um, and over the past five years, it's been very busy, very busy scheme. But I think we've done a lot of good outcomes. I suppose I can see firsthand the impact that it's had, you know, on our children that they haven't had to be admitted into care and from working, you know, frontline and fostering services within the South Eastern Trust, where we have a regional issue now in terms of recruiting foster carers, it is challenging getting fostering placements for children. This scheme is a brilliant opportunity for our families who are on the edge of coming into care, where we can step in with Jade, identify those families that we're potentially maybe looking at foster placements for, and we can go in and work immensely and really, really, you know, really strongly with the families to try and prevent that from happening. Awesome. And I suppose that's why I really can see the, the benefits of the scheme. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Shauna. Um, I will go to Louise. Louise, will you give us a brief introduction to your project and partnership? Louise, I'm the manager with the Family First project. We work in partnership with the Northern Health and Social Care Trust, primarily the Family Support and Inter Intervention Team, alongside with Debbie, I'll let her introduce herself. We work with uh, children that are at risk or on the Child Protection Register, and we work with the mums and the children and the family together um, to reduce risk, and we offer practical and emotional support and education in the family home to try and reduce risk and ultimately prevent children from entering the care system. Brilliant. Thank you. Lisa. Yeah, I'm Debbie Williams. I'm a social work service manager in the Northern Trust and I'm part of the um, partnership working along with Louise and our colleagues in Women's Aid. Um, it really is a, a vital partnership at, at reducing risk for families at a, at a point of crisis almost when children's names are being added to the Child Protection Register where risks are increasing and we try to get in there quickly and promptly with a, you know, a, a service that the family need that's needs led and won't be the same for every single family but Louise and her staff um, work very well and are very good at engaging families who are sometimes reluctant to engage with statutory services. Thank you Debbie. Okay Heather and Cahill do you want to give me two minutes on your project? Okay um, our project is Moving Up Moving On or MUMO and um, based in Four Spring Inter Community Group on Belfast's Springfield Road, delivered in partnership with um, St. Clair's Primary School, of which <coughs> Cahill O'Doherty is the principal, Springfield Primary School and Relate NI. Um, we have two children support workers, uh, one based in each school, two family engagement workers, one um, attached to each school and based in Fourth Spring. <clears throat> and we also have a schools counsellor through Relate NI who um, provides counselling with children. Um, so the in-school activity would very much be focusing on working with the children on social and um, emotional support. Um, and they do activities such as Lego therapy, team building, um, walk a mile challenge, that sort of activity. And um, the family engagement workers, they do one-to-one -one work with families. They can do um, <clears throat> whole work with families if appropriate. Um, and they organize a program of activity for parents, um, wide range of activities from exercise programs to uh, walking challenges to um, <clears throat> facilitating a weekly women's group to um, 
as a, and then as a whole team delivering family events like Family Matters, a monthly session with parents and children from the two schools doing activity and eat together. Thank you. I don't know if Cahill wants to add anything. Cahill, you're on mute. Team principals, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> you know, the great thing about um, about Mumo is that it is something, it is a project which actually attacks directly at the schools uh, the problems that exist. And we knew coming down the line during, during the pandemic, we knew we were going to be met with a tsunami of uh, mental health issues and anxiety both from our parent body and from the children. And these people who work with us through MUMO are very well established. There's not a high turnaround of staff. So they become very familiar with the pupils and the parents. And they really get at the nub of uh, the issues and help us from a pastoral point of view, a safeguard point of view, and from an academic point of view, because we also have our transition workers there. We have our counselors, as Heather said. And just yesterday, for example, we uh, we give a, a day aside every couple of months, whereby we have a multidisciplinary team. And the multidisciplinary team looks at a load of cases for children with so many different issues uh, across the school. And someone in the room will be able to take responsibility for action and against a child or a family to help them. And Mumu are always present there because of their uh, outreach to things such as counselling and family support, etc. It is a brilliant example. We would be lost without it. We couldn't do without it here in school now. But it's a brilliant example of how partnership works within the community, in the school and at the Coalface. That's brilliant. That's a great place for us to start, Cahill. Um, just for um, there are other participants, the reason why we're talking today is because these are three projects in which there was a successful partnership between the voluntary sector and the statutory sector. So we have two social work partnerships and an education partnership. And I suppose the thing that we wanted to talk about today was, firstly, how does the partnership working actually benefit families? And then secondly, these three partnerships did not start out being wildly successful. They were never unsuccessful, but they didn't start out the way they are now. So my sort of two things that I want to talk about today in the, in the 15 minutes that we've got left is um, what was the benefit to the families of this partnership? How did they benefit in a way that they wouldn't have done if you hadn't worked so well in partnership? And secondly, how did you make it a successful partnership? So I will start off in the, in the same order that we came in. Um, I'll start off with step up, step down. Um, what do you think was the benefit to families, not just of the service, but of the fact that the partnership was, was, um, was strong? Yep, great. Um, gosh, so many benefits for families in, in us working in partnership and I'll give an overview and Sean is so good at, at drilling down into the, the, the detail of it. Um, but certainly from what we're hearing from families, um, things like the referral pathways and accessibility to services. Um, whenever we're talking about edge of care, that might be families where the children have already been in care and are back home. It might be families where the children are on the child protection register and a care admission could be being sought in the, you know, in the near future, or it could actually be families where there's been a kind of one-off crisis, a bereavement or loss of a job or something like that, that has brought the family into a different space than they've been in before. And for all the wide spectrum of families that we're working with, there are different relationships with services. And a lot of families would say that they find it maybe very tricky to access services that are helpful or um, the pathways can be difficult, the services themselves might not have worked for them. Mm -hmm. So in working in partnership, the families have talked about how they feel um, so much more able to access the support, to direct the support, to say what it is that they actually need. And there are elements that the trust bring, um, like it, the infrastructure and mm -hmm. the social workers who are referring families, for example, and um, the safeguarding elements, the fostering elements, um, and all of all of that infrastructure and scaffolding. And then the, the, the voluntary sector, so foster network are able to, um, our director Kathleen words this really beautifully, she says, there's a front door that is just so appealing and welcoming for families, and they feel really able to walk through it. They feel that it's their decision. And to get involved and there are things that we can do maybe quite quickly just because we have a different structure in place so we've worked to each other's strengths 
um, and we've been really family led. And just one other thing is around how we work in a really nurturing, attachment focused and trauma informed way. And that is with the families, but it's also with each other at organizational levels. So it feeds right through the whole, all of the strands of the project. So Shauna. You know, I agree, you know, that we've had many discussions about, you know, how Step Up, Step Down has been successful. And I don't think it would have been as successful if it just had been us as a trust leading this. It wouldn't have worked the same without the, the voluntary sector. And I suppose what I see from the front line of, of social work is that a lot of our families are disenfranchised. They are isolated, they're living in poverty, they've mental health, domestic violence, a lot of issues. So they're very weary, weary mm -hmm. and very worried about maybe where this is going in terms of their children being on the register or they're in court with pre proceedings. And you see seen then whenever you had the service in partnership with SUST and funded by the big lottery, that completely helped the family get on board, meeting Jade and having those discussions about the scheme. It wasn't just us, the trust, it was Jade too. It was that partnership working that really benefited the family. The families could see from a very early point of who everybody was in the scheme and who everybody's role was. So we always met at, a, at the starting point whenever a family was referred. They got to know us, knew what our role was, what our expectations was. We had a shared vision and a shared goal mm -hmm. that we want your child to stay at home with you. The trust don't want to remove your child either. This is what we're trying to do. Tell mm -hmm. us what's working well using our signs of safety, the approach, you know, we've all been trained in the same areas. And I think that really came through that we're all we're using the same language even too, yes. in terms of common language, shared goals, talking about what is it that we need to achieve here? What are you going to do? What is it that you need to do to change? So I think you could see the families understood what Jade's role was, what my role was in the trust. And that benefited them in terms of, we're all saying the same thing here. There's no mixed messages. This is what the outcome is what we want and this is what we're going to work towards mm -hmm. so the fact yes. that you know we're involved with the family for a year or two help them understand that and see from a very early point of view that each time we met every three months it was the same goals mm -hmm. same aspirations mm -hmm. so i feel that that boundary side has just been so worthwhile and i think we've worked really well together and i think that that has benefited the families that they've seen that we had a good relationship with each other too at the meetings yes, that we were yes, mutually absolutely. respectful of each each other uh -huh. We weren't different or conflict or difference of opinion. It was the same information. And I yes. think that to me was key in terms yes. of working so well together. There was no hierarchy. There uh -huh. was no, you know, difference of opinion uh -huh. or you do that and we'll do this. It was what uh -huh. are we going to do as a team? Uh -huh. And the foster cares very much from whenever I recruited the foster cares come on to SUST, I involved them in the process as much as us too. Mm -hmm. They were the frontline carers working with these families and the children. So they were saying the same thing too. And they were part of the meetings and mm -hmm. it, it just worked so well collaboratively okay. as a team. So the, the team approach, which I yes. think really benefited the families and the feedback from the families too. You know, whenever they came to the meetings, you know, you could see that, that they were benefiting from the service. They were able to give that feedback and help us too. look at how we needed to change things too. Mm -hmm. and it's a partnership with families thing. as well as partnership yeah. with each other yeah. mm -hmm. so um, I think that was really helpful yes and you've you've hit on a couple of things that have come up quite strongly um in our work which is um shared vision and also mutual respect those two things have come out um really strongly in the in the study that we have done um so Thank you very much for that, guys. I'm going to move on to Debbie and Louise. Um, the benefits for the families. Yeah, so we're going to be saying a lot of the same things. Is that right? Good, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> it is about that buy-in, the commitment from the very beginning, having that shared vision. Um, it was also about working hard, that anything that's worth doing isn't going to be easy. So there's a lot of hard work building relationships from the very beginning. Um, we have a steering group that's very successful and it guides the project. Um, we're talking about signs of safety as well. It has given us a platform and a tool to work alongside families in a shared language that um, makes it easy to be very family centered. Um, so yes, it's, uh, the project has helped with engagement for the hard to reach families um, as we advocate for um, social workers towards mums, um, mums for social workers, and also for the children's voices as well to ensure that their voices is being 
care. So a big part of Family First role is about advocacy. Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the big benefits for us is that we, you know, Family First really have the expertise and Women's Aid as an organisation of the expertise in domestic violence. And it permeates so many elements of the statutory social work role. And really, this is a very targeted service that's in the own, the family's own home that meets the needs of the mum, but also the children. It'll be the same worker working with both components. And it keeps a good holistic view of where the family are at and what that family need at any given point in time with good flexibility from women's aid to respond and be responsive, whether that's educative work around domestic violence or work around nurture and play therapy or, or whatever it is. There's uh, individual work needed for the children around the trauma they've experienced, but we really find families engage so much more willingly with that service yes. um, rather than us coming with our statutory hats on um, and looking at them having difficult discussions about you know, removing children. Families who maybe would have gone into a hostel or a refuge and women's aid would have had a, a really very good and comprehensive service, but we're trying to replicate that in the community and the family's own home, meeting the family's needs where they are, and ultimately always trying to reduce the risk to the children and reduce the need for statutory involvement, really. Um, and we've been so successful at that and the volume and the figures that we've um, you know, dealt with over the past number of years within the project have continued to rise. But one of our big challenges really is around funding and securing that funding long-term. And I'm sure the other projects to see Francis is question in the chat there just around that and you know that's an ongoing uh -huh. battle's maybe too strong a word but it's an ongoing issue for us mm -hmm. and and debbie um i'm thinking about your project over time and has would you agree that there has been some sort of mutual sort of capacity building of both sets of staff absolutely a huge amount of that and i think that's come We've had very good support from our senior managers. They've been bought into the project from the get-go. And it is five years in the making now. Um, and with funding for another two. But you know, we had we had won a social work award at the NISC Awards back in 2018. Um, and our work was recognized there. And we've had a, a conference that we shared the learning at in 2019 with the awareness raising video that's in the chat for folks to see in 2020. And it's about continually building that. We've developed our um, domestic violence champions, which um, within each social work team, we would have a domestic violence champion. And um, we're working our next kind of phase is about ingratiating and bringing them into the steering group so that they can, and it's continually developing, Melanie, you know, those different, you know, we're always reviewing what worked well last year. What do we need to think about developing next year? Simple things like getting a wee bit of a monthly update in terms of each family. So governance wise on the trust file, there's a bit of a record and a record, mm -hmm. but it's it's continually, we didn't do that at the start, but it's building that in terms okay. of seeing the, and reviewing what's working for any family yeah. and focusing on the strengths all of the time, really. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, um, very heavily invested. I think that's commendable. It's all our trust partners are extremely supportive. Yes, that investment. A lead, you know, somebody advocating on the inside, I think. And yes. Being on the ball, there's a lot of pressure on social services time, um, mm -hmm. but there's an awful lot of time and investment and commitment to the project, mm -hmm. which is tremendous. Yes, well, that's another that's another one that's going to come up later. It's just that that commitment and the investment of time, which is hard to find, but absolutely essential. Um, so I'm going to give you a fair warning now. Because of time, I'm going to ask you for at the end for one practical thing, very short practical thing that you did to make your partnership successful. So you you four can sit and think about that while poor Heather and Cahill have to be on the on the hoof. And uh, can I just address that that same question to um, to you at moving up, moving on. Um, um, about um, just how did the partnership benefit the families? Carl, you've already alluded to it. Um, you might want to build a little bit on that. Heather? Um, well, what everybody else has said, 100%. Um, uh, and as well as that, I think it, uh, the partnership has allowed us to offer a deep level of social, uh, practical, emotional support, as Jennifer was talking about. <clears throat> I would say it is like uh, maximizing, enhancing, and enhancing, deepening the work of the project and the outcomes. Um, I think it's, it maximizes impact, resources, connections, networks, 
outputs the number of participants, it maximizes the impact, the outcomes. Um, something very important to both schools has been the cross community element, as we have one uh, state primary school and one um, Catholic control school. Um, that's been very important. <clears throat> Um, it's maximised opportunities for co-design. It's allowed us to build good, solid relationships with our main partners and then with our sort of uh, sub-partners at the level um, below that. Um, it allows us all to see situations from other people's point of view, us to see situations from the school's point of view, and then to see uh, situations from maybe a family's point of view, offering more information that they haven't had before. Mm -hmm. And it allows us to grow, to develop, um, to adapt and to respond to needs as they arise. Heather, can I ask you a specific question? Would you, mm -hmm. would you say that being actually located within the school was a benefit in terms of reaching the families that you were trying to help? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, we'll have the children support worker in the school and they will be working with children. They can liaise with the family engagement worker. They can say, um, you know, that they think a family needs support and the family engagement worker can make direct contact with them, yeah. Okay, okay. Cahill, quickly, have you anything to add to that? Yes, I, I would say there's something which um, the Women's Aid uh, reps were saying there as well. It's probably um, parents come to the school to look for help is something which in the past would have been a difficult thing for them. Uh, there would have been a certain amount of apprehension with that. They certainly wouldn't have engaged. But the fact that this partnership is so strong and we have the alternative of either meeting here or meeting up at Fourth Spring, which is just up the road a little bit. Uh, but it's just now, I think the parent body have come to see that, yeah, if there is a problem that... Uh, something that we've always wanted to do here in St. Clair's, that we we can be seen as a hub, a community hub for them, so that, yes, of course, it's a, a, it's a school, but it's also a place where uh, where we are reaching out and we can actually find solutions thanks to the partnership. And the one thing that you were asking, that if there's one thing which uh, has helped the relationship, I think it's the quality of the partnership and the quality of the relationships, how ourselves and uh, Springfield Primary and the Mumu uh, organization, the Fourth Spring organization, have actually gelled together and worked so seamlessly together. Uh, mm -hmm. We're committed to it. That's that's the main thing. We see the benefit of it and the relationships make it work. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, Jade, one thing practical that you did that made the partnership successful to close. Yes, um, I was going to say things like I was based in the trust offices a bit or I was in their email accounts and all that stuff but do you know what um actually I completely agree we worked really hard to build relationships with each other and out of those relationships all the practical things happened yeah. um right. so I think it's important that it's that way around brilliant thank you Jade Shauna I'm just going to say exactly the same as Jade. It was just about relationships, sharing resources. You know, Jade coming to our trust training, me going to the training with her from the, with the foster network, using each other's bases for meetings, for steering group committee meetings, um, social work forums and the trust. Jade coming along with that with me, me going to. It was just that the relationships, as Jade says, and the, all the practical elements did come after that. So I, th I think that's why it did work so well. Brilliant. Brilliant. And I think it's fair to say that relationships don't just happen, that they actually have to be invested in. Yeah. Um, Debbie and Louise. For us, it would be communication. So that was our steering groups, our advisory panels, our regular communication through meetings, telephone communication is key because it just builds relationships. Yeah. Yeah, I would just echo that really. That's been the most helpful bit. And the shared training, you know, in terms of science of safety that both organisations are, are part of has been really useful. Brilliant. Thank you. And Heather, we'll finish with you. Um, I think possibly the um, shared vision, shared commitment to the families. Yeah. And being able to respond flexibly um, and being able to adapt and having the flexibility from funders as well, which has been very important. First of all, the long-term investment from funders mm -hmm. and then having a funder that's prepared to be flexible and allow you to add a bit, take away a bit, um, to adapt the programme to suit the needs of your um, participants. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
listen, I can't thank you enough for being prepared to come on and uh, to talk about your projects in front of all these people. I really do appreciate it. And always, it's a pleasure talking to you. Um, and uh, I'm just going to take this opportunity just as I finish here to thank um, the steering group from the Reaching Out Supporting Families programme that has been an excellent steering group from the very beginning and really committed and has helped us to put this together today. So I definitely would advocate for a good steering group being a good thing for partnership working. So thank you very much, guys. Neve. Thanks, Mel. So uh, I think that was a really great panel and I'm sure you would join me in uh, giving them a virtual round of applause for their for their contribution in front of the larger group. So you can just hit the reactions there on Zoom and, and give them a clap if you want to. Um, also, just to say that your uh, your discussion has generated quite a lot of questions uh, people that are keen to connect with you um, and give you words of encouragement. So, you know, do have a to, to everyone involved in that panel. You might just have a look at some of the comments and questions that are coming through there. Um, so the next part of this event is going to give us the opportunity to get together in some smaller breakout rooms. And I know you'll all be looking forward to that at this stage. Uh, but before we do that, I'm going to go back to Melanie again to ask her to warm us up for that discussion. And Mel, you're going to share some of the emerging messages from the from the programme with us. Yes, I am indeed. Um, so. As you've already heard today, we've been working alongside and studying this amazingly diverse group of projects for six years now. And that has given us the opportunity to identify the elements that were key to the success of the projects over their lifespan. Um, there's a lot of learning and has already been said, there's more to be published. But we've, for today, we've identified three key points that we believe need further attention, discussion and a response. Um, these have been observed through the programme and then they've been verified from current research and other organisations who are working in this field. In bringing these points to you today, we want to ask the so what question. Why does any of this learning matter? So the first key message from the Reaching Out Supporting Families programme is commission for outcomes rather than activities. Funding from the National Lottery Community Fund allowed projects to adapt their engagement and family support practice, but always continuing towards the three core programme outcomes. This helped families in at least two ways. Um, projects were able to provide a longer lead in time where necessary, and they were able to use the evidence they were generating about what works with their families to refine and improve their practice model. So it was a combination of evidence of what works in the wider world and, for example, what works with this group of parents in this school in North Belfast or rural Tyrone. Had they not been able to flex and adapt to the changing needs of families over time, some of the projects would not have been able to reach, never mind help the families they went on to work with successfully. So commissioning solely for target numbers and the delivery of robustly tested programs with tight time scales is attractively measurable. Um, but at this early intervention stage, our so-called hard to reach families may remain inaccessible, slip through the net, and then first come to notice at crisis stage. That's not in anyone's interests and it isn't measured. It's worth noticing that we, noting that we would assert that families are not so very hard to reach, but that where there's a lack of flexibility in engagement models and in pacing of the work, it's this, us, the support services that can be hard to navigate and find a way into. We would suggest that we look afresh at how we commission services that are robust, have measurable outcomes in place, have flexibility on how they achieve these outcomes and can generate and use evidence of what works locally. Accountability for public money remains, but services voluntary and statutory are better able to use home generated evidence to engage and help families whose needs they understand. The second message is, Early intervention services must be protected alongside crisis services. Now, the key observation here is not that funds need to be secured for early intervention. I think we can all agree on that and acknowledge that it has proved hard to protect prevention and early intervention when the immediate needs of society are high and the short term outcomes are hard to measure. Statutory health, social care, education services are more stretched than ever and cannot offer support to families who do not absolutely require their services. There's increased pressure on delivery, longer waiting lists and higher thresholds. But there's also limited provision in the middle ground. 
Our observation is that those services that set out to focus on prevention and early intervention find it harder to keep that focus as families' experiences of adversity result in their need for more complex support. And projects in the Reaching Out Supporting Families program had to invest in additional staff training that they didn't anticipate um, with cost and staff retention implications. And they had to change their practice models to accommodate more complex needs. The sector is known for its flexibility, which is great, but the impact is that the true prevention and early intervention work can drift. If we want to get it right for families, we need to design family support services that cover the spectrum from that prevention and early intervention through each of the stages to crisis intervention without compromising the early work. We don't propose to have the solution to this today, but we believe it's an issue that's not going to go away and we would welcome your input into the discussion. So my third and final key message is strong partnership working benefits families experiencing adversity. So you've just heard professionals talking about the benefits to families and to their own organizations of strong partnership working across the statutory and the voluntary sector. And you've heard families tell us that they want us to work together to make sure that they get the right help early. It's come from their mouths. The research also tells us that good partnership working prevents families from falling through the net. Good referral pathways, relationships between professionals, local networks can help families access the support they need in a timely way. And we have a successful model for this in the family support hubs in Northern Ireland. Families experiencing multiple adversities may be engaging with a variety of services and good partnership working can support a coordinated approach to engaging with them. Soft handovers increasing the likelihood that families will engage. In this programme, there was six particular success where partner organisations were able to acknowledge their differences and respect each other as equal as experts in different domains. And you heard that voiced just before. Conversely, we have observed that where mutual respect is lacking, there are consequences for families. And what we've seen is that the inequalities they already face can, can be exacerbated. But the benefits of strong partnership working are there to see. In some instances, voluntary organisations could advocate on behalf of statutory services, improving their perception among service users. And in turn, voluntary organisations were able to gain credibility and become more trusted among the statutory sector, opening opportunities for funding and further collaboration. It is a win-win situation. Our observation of partnership working has been pretty mixed, and there's definitely room for improvement. Building good, building good partnerships requires effort, trust and respect and it takes time and investment. Time and resources for anything outside of the core work is precious and scarce. But if we don't find it and invest in partnership working, there will be holes in that safety net that we work so hard to put in place for families. Again, as we move into discussion groups, we would welcome your input and we'll use your ideas and evidence as we go forward. We really want you to contribute your expertise to the overall capturing the learning work of reaching out supporting families. Um, in the meantime, I think we're going to have another short break and then Okay, welcome back everyone. So as you're coming back to join us, if you'll take a couple of minutes or your note taker will take a couple of minutes to uh, pop some of your key points into the chat, just, just if you had a Word document, just cut and paste them across. If you didn't have time to do that, don't worry. Um, you can always send something through to members of the team, members of the CS team, so Melanie or Mark at a later stage. Um, sorry to hear that there were a couple of connection problems in some of the rooms and we're happy to figure out another way to capture your feedback with you and follow up and follow up after that. So um, thanks very much for adding that in. So we're heading into the, the final phase of this event now and um, I, it's a panel discussion and I'm going to hand over to Magella McCluskey. Magella is a senior manager at CES and Magella is going to chair this final phase of the event. Over to you Magella. Hi everyone. Um, first of all, can everyone hear me okay? Um, 
I'm delighted to be here this afternoon with you, or this morning it still is, with you to chair this panel discussion. Um, as you've no doubt heard already, at CES we're really committed to disseminating this key learning from reaching out supporting families today and beyond. And I now want to take some of the key issues that you've heard and considered this morning and explore them with a significant panel of departmental officials and um, our own third sector leader. Um, so let me tell you who we have with us. So first of all, I'm delighted to be joined by Mark Bailey. Mark is from the Department of Health. He is responsible for both the development of the department's new family and parenting support strategy, which will, which will be delivered on a cross departmental basis and the department's core funding. And I know there are other departmental officials with us today, including Paul McConville on the social work side. Paul Brush is here. You're very welcome, Paul. Paul's the director of early years, children and youth at the Department of Education. He has responsibility for early education and childcare and the children and young people and youth policy, um, children and young people strategy and youth policy. Moira Doherty is a deputy secretary for the engaged community group in the Department for Communities. And Moira's responsibilities include the active communities division, community empowerment, and the voluntary and community uh, division. And we're rejoined by Sandra McNamee, who, as you heard earlier, is a National Lottery Community Fund, Northern Ireland Committee member, and our Reaching Out Supporting Families uh, program champion, as I've been calling her. And finally, Seamus McAlevey, who is the Chief Executive of NICFA, which represents community and voluntary sector organizations and has over a thousand community and voluntary sector organizations in its membership. So how would the panel is going to work is that I'm gonna to go to each of the panel members for a, a short response to what they've heard so far today. Um, as Melanie indicated, we're now at the kind of now what stage of proceedings. So, so what are we gonna do now? So I'm gonna to go to each of the panel members as they appear on my screen. So Sandra, Seamus, Moira, Mark and Paul. And then I'm going to unpick and, and explore some of the, the key questions and key points that have emerged mm. this morning with the, the panel members. So I'm going to go to you first, Sandra, for a response and then to Seamus. Okay, thanks so much. Um, Majella Guinness, there's so much to pick up on. I think I'm going to really struggle to keep it to the two minutes. Um, but there's, there's two key things really that, um, that we've picked up on a lot today and I've been jotting down notes as we've gone on. Um, the first one really is partnership working and that really jumps out, I think, um, at all of us today. And as I said earlier, this was really central to the programme. And what we can really see today is that this was such a positive thread um, running through all the projects, their experiences of building connections and working together um, has been such a huge success factor, I think, um, in terms of shaping the projects and having an impact. Um, and the research did tell us that the benefits to families um, created through organisations working in partnership exceed those that either partner could achieve alone. And I think we really see this today. And um, we do know from research and also from what we've heard today, um, the partnership working doesn't just happen. Um, it needs to be cultivated and it needs to be invested in. And I really enjoyed hearing from the three projects today. And, and I enjoyed their honesty um, as well in terms of how they combine their strengths. And I think Jade from Step Up, Step Down said they work to each other's strengths. And I think this is really, really important. And um, we also heard about challenging partnership can be, and we know this. Um, especially in the early days. And it was really great to hear the projects talking about that and how they overcame that. Um, I remember once somebody saying to me that sometimes the best partnership starts off with a really challenging discussion. And I think they're certainly learning in that. Um, but definitely it needs to be led. It needs to have a shared vision. It needs to have mutual respect. We heard that term. And a really strong commitment to working together to achieving that vision. And I think that's really shown through today. And Cathal talked about quality relationships. 
and relationships make it work. And we talked about that in the breakout room. And we concluded if we could get relationships and communications right, and we would be in a much better place. And so it has to start with relationships. I suppose just to say that we at the fund have learned a lot about the importance of partnerships in the past year, um, especially when COVID started to completely redefine our lives and, and our normality. And it brought home to us the importance of, of trusted and meaningful partnerships. And it's really something that we have built on and that we are building on. Um, we are really utilizing our close connections with our grant holders and the communities where we are based to gain that real insight into the emerging needs out there. Um, we do recognize that these relationships and partnerships with our customers, our grant holders, and our wider stakeholders are really key to our impact as a funder. And we are always listening and learning about what we can do differently or what's working well that we can build on. And for us, it's really important that we continue to do this. Um, and we work in this way as we start building back from the pandemic. And we have strengthened our connections with other funders in the past year and through close collaboration. And this has been really particularly evident with the development of a strong funders forum for Northern Ireland, which we're involved in. And um, we know that by working more closely with other funders, we can better serve the communities that we work with and maximize the collective impacts. Um, very quickly, the other one important thing that I want to pick up that we've heard a lot about today as well is flexibility. And again, this is so inherent in the Supporting Families programme, and it was really important to us from the very start. I've seen a lot of comments in the chat about this, and we really wanted projects to have that flexibility so that they could try and test different approaches. And we were really keen to hear as much about what didn't work as what did work so that we could build on that as well. Um, okay. Thank you. What good family support looks like. So thank you, Majel. I could go on, but I'll I can tell uh, Sandra and Sandra okay. mentioned COVID, Seamus, and I think it's universally accepted that the third sector, community and voluntary sector, stepped up during this period. So interested to hear your thoughts on what you've heard today and how that's combined with the wider kind of enhanced understanding of our sector over the past uh, 18, 24 months. Yeah, thanks, Magellan. Thanks for the invitation to come along today. And I suppose first thing to say, <clears throat> it was great to hear, you know, about all the projects and, and the great and valuable work that has been done. I would commend the National Lottery, uh, you know, Community Fund mm -hmm. as well for taking this strategic approach, taking a longer term approach. Uh, that's really good. It's not the first time uh, that, that they've done that and they've been doing it for a number of years. And that's important. Uh, and I suppose... Uh, the other thing is capturing this uh, and providing the report that you and CES have done. That has been important. So when Melanie outlined those three key messages, they really resonated with me. And actually, much because of the work that has gone on during the COVID pandemic, Moira is on here as well, you know, so some of our stuff may well overlap. Uh, but the minister set up an emergencies leadership group right at the very start, literally days before lockdown uh, kicked in, uh, a partnership between government side and, and representatives from voluntary and community organisations. Moira went on to, uh, you know, to, to chair that. And there was immense learning that came from all of that. And we learned by doing, and we did things fairly quickly. And the interesting thing, and the feedback that started to come from members was that we built trust, built relationships, and that helped in, in the delivery. We tried things out, and if things didn't work, we moved on and, and did other things. We also put a lot of emphasis on communication and communicating with the sector at large, trying to keep everybody in the loop with regard uh, to what was being done. And the big thing I see here is the focus on outcomes. and uh, That's what we uh, you know, I think have been trying to do for a long time. I remember the last crisis that we faced, which was the financial one back in 2008, 2010. And we in NICFA produced a short report then on smart solutions and tough times. And what we talked about was early intervention was one of the ways to cut off huge costs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of the future, because the state always has to pick up the tab when things are at their worst. You know, when you're taking children into yeah. care, when you've got people in hospitals, uh, when you're putting people in prisons, all of that becomes very, very expensive. Whereas early intervention can save uh, an, awful, an awful lot of that. So we were talking about smart solutions 
uh, in tough times back then. The response from government in Northern Ireland as well was to think about a new way to do things, which became the work that led to the draft programme for government. Uh, it was good to hear Minister Kearney, you know, mentioned this morning about the consultation on the draft outcomes framework. I mean, it's really important. And it's something that the voluntary and community sector can play into. And from our sector's point of view, gives us an opportunity to really focus on the outcomes. Because the high level outcomes in that draft programme uh, depend so much on what goes on across society to try and achieve them. You know, with over 80% of the determinants of good health being outside the control uh, of the Department of Health, you know, shows us uh, mm -hmm. that we need a much more collaborative uh, approach. Yeah. And the thing about partnership is that partnership's only necessary when you can't, when an organization can't achieve something on its own, when it can't deliver the solution. And so many of the things that we are talking about require partnership. Yeah. So going back to the Emergencies Leadership Group, one of the things that we're very conscious of when we talk to the Permanent Secretaries Group about, about this, everybody's in agreement that we need to change, we need to be more flexible, and we need to do that going forward. We know the greatest danger is that when the crisis passes, we all, human nature, we all revert back to the way we used to do things. So it's not that people are bad or they don't care, it's just that that ends up the problem. And we have to recognize it'll require substantial work to make change happen. Minister, uh, you know, for, for communities, asked NICFA to bring forward a paper, Manifesto for Change. And we're working with the department now on that in terms of an outline framework about how we would make some of these changes for the better in the future. So as you know, Mangela, I'm always hopeful. I always think change can happen, but I do recognize that it takes a lot of work and we're always in difficulty of simply falling back. Thanks, Seamus. Um, so ma making new ways of working stick, stick for the future, Moira. Um, how do we make this happen? Uh, starting with a simple question to you. Um, yeah, sure, two minutes. I'll have that done in 30 seconds, Magella, surely. Um, so I think just building on, on uh, what Seamus has said and, and you know what, what, what we heard this morning was just amazing, both in terms of the projects and what they were delivering, but also I have to, to give a, a shout out to uh, National Lottery Community Foundation because certainly from our point of view within um, Department for Communities, we, we see um, Kate and colleagues in, in lottery as, as um, potential mentors for us in you know, the feedback that we get from um, the organizations and the people on the ground is that the way lottery does it as a funder is how we should be aspiring. And certainly Kate and I have had uh, quite a few conversations and, and lottery were a brilliant partner for us throughout the emergency. So we th this really aligns with what we've been hearing around funding flexibility and partnership. And those, those two things just come up time and again. And our minister, I think, you know, the, the benefit of having a minister that comes from the community sector has been really clear because she had very high levels of trust in the sector and was very clear that she wanted us to uh, make sure that that was at the heart of the approach during the emergency. And I'll just give one example uh, because I know we're tight for time and I'll, I'll move on. But um, it was very clear to us, yes, we set up this emergencies leadership group and we were around the table as equal partners. Um, but it was very clear that the community and community organisations were the first responders and were already out the door and getting support to the people who needed it. And that it was important for us to trust what those folk were telling us were the needs. So one small example is that at the very beginning, you might recall the number that was being used around shielding was 40,000. So that was the number that was that was in circulation. Of course, nobody knew, but it was the um, the estimate. And one of our community partners around the table said, "That just doesn't feel right to me. When I see the numbers within our community that are shielding, I, I just don't think that forty thousand feels right." And we now know, you know, some time after that, actually, it was um, many times more than forty thousand. It was a wee bit yeah. closer to three hundred thousand. So. In terms of our modeling then at the time, yes, we had this estimate, 
But the fact that our community partners were saying that doesn't feel right meant that we were able to build in flex into the programme to ensure that actually there was the potential to uplift beyond that um, in terms of the help that was needed. And I think that's just a very small example because we had a very, very rich experience over the last you know, 18, 18 months, two years. Um, and I think that, that piece just exemplified for me what you're saying about the insight that comes from those closest to the community, but also the importance for us to trust those insights and then to work with that. So um, yes, I, I'll not say any more now, uh, but very happy to answer questions as we go. Thanks, Moira. Mark, one of the key things that you're responsible for is the development of the family and parenting support strategy. And obviously the entire morning has, has been very aligned with that. Interested to hear your thoughts and maybe a sh very short update on where the strategy is for people. Through the forum, my laptop has picked the worst possible time to constrain my internet connection. So I hope you can all hear me okay. <laughs> yeah, we're hearing you fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, when I came into post um, and I discovered I had policy responsibility for family support, I asked myself two questions. What exactly is family support? How do I define this? And how can I deliver good family support? Uh, to my horror, I concluded that that almost all commission services across the country are family support because they should improve families' lives to some extent. Um, and to my great satisfaction then, I concluded that I can't deliver good family support that we need to work together. And that's together across all government departments. And um, it's also across sectors. And we've heard a lot about that this morning. Um, so I'm particularly relieved that since the Children's Services Cooperation Act, the strategy going forward will be underpinned not just by a desire to work together, but a statutory duty to work together. Um, by way of reassurance to everybody that's spoken this morning, um, we have a set of outcomes and a set of underpinning principles for the strategy. The underpinning principles will resonate perfectly with some of the learning coming through from this program. Uh, the six principles are do it early, do it well, do what works, do it with families, not to them do it together and help families to do it for themselves. And I think we've heard um, on each of those themes um, this morning uh, from a number of people. Um, in terms of where we're at with the strategy, um, it's been beset by a number of resourcing challenges over the last couple of years, COVID, not just six. Um, I also have policy responsibility for the regulation of childcare, um, which has caused me endless nightmares over the past two years. Um, so it's not where I would have wanted it to be but it is our intention within the next year that it's gone out for public consultation. I want the strategy to be endorsed by the executive first. So it'll be an executive strategy going out for consultation and published then towards the end of 2022. And I would still have a lot of engagement to do. We've engaged with young people and children. We've engaged with parents themselves. I think we have a lot more of that to do once we have a document pulled together. Um, but that's the sort of indicative timeline. If you'll indulge me for one more minute, one thing I really want to say to everybody from a Department of Health perspective is well done and congratulations to everybody who's been involved with this program. If there's one thing civil servants are good at, it's catastrophizing. And I can say with absolute certainty that without the support that's been offered through this program, some pretty horrendous things would have happened to some of the families who have received support. Without getting too dark, I think you all know where some of these families end up if they're not properly supported. So thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Mark. And Paul, it's great to have the Department of Education um, here. Mark mentioned the, uh, the statutory duty to cooperate and you're responsible for the children and young people strategy as well as early years. So interested to hear your thoughts on what you've heard this morning and how it might align with some of the developments in education. Yes, thanks, Magella, and thanks to everyone who's participated, I have to say. Um, I have found it stimulating, challenging in equal measure and um, really thoroughly enjoyed the presentations and have a lot of things to go away and think about. And it's some of those things I want to sort of just throw into the, to the mix now. Um, as you say, I have responsibility for um, the early years. So, um, you know, I don't need to be convinced about the absolute importance of early intervention. Um, I'm particularly focused on that early intervention in the first few years of a child's life, really up until the point at which they go to primary school. And I think that that's 
um, absolutely essential. The, the evidence base for it is enormous, and I think that helps to reinforce all that you're doing around the sort of wider definition of intervening early. I was struck, I think, by um, a lot of the good practice points that were coming out in terms of how do you engage families meaningfully with integrity um, across a whole range of government policy objectives. And of course, the area I'm thinking of is the education of their children. How do we engage families in that absolutely essential process? And in my area of early years, we have, I think, made some good uh, efforts at that. Um, there's a getting, re getting Ready suite of programmes that involve parental involvement in the child's very, very early education, really right from the word go. Um, it's an example of collaboration delivered through health, largely health visitors are the first people that interact often with the mummy and the baby um, through those very early years. Often a child doesn't come into contact with the education system per se until they go to their preschool year. But yet we know that it's so important to have started before that and on that learning journey. So there's a lot we could talk about in terms of how what you have been telling us is good practice and how that links into, into the, the, the getting ready to programs. Um, sure Start is another really good example, and I was delighted that there were Sure Start people in my breakout room. Um, a really, really excellent example of collaboration, of involvement of parents and families, of this holistic approach of not just um, trying to solve the problems, but empowering the parents in, in so many ways, even just to understand the importance of playing with their small children, physical activity, um, healthy eating, whole range of very, very practical things right from the word go. And I think we've more to learn even from your research on even how to fine tune some of that engagement and how to make sure that we just bring families along that journey and along along that trajectory. Finally, maybe just a reflection of where some of all of this might land and where it might have an immediate um, policy relevance. Um, a year or so ago, the education minister commissioned an independent report into um, educational underachievement, really looking at what are the key factors contributing to um, a large number of young people underachieving in the education system. That report was published in the summer and it puts a huge emphasis on investment in the early years. In fact, it's called the Fair Start Report and more than half of its, of its recommendations are around refocusing and I suppose reorienting our funding to the early years. There are, I think, 14 actions, 13 actions in that space around building better families from the word go. What does that look like? We're embarking on work just to define how we take that forward. And I think it's a perfect opportunity to build in much of the learning from this from what you've been telling us this morning as we start to consider well what would that look like it's a big investment we have to secure that yet argue for it 50 million a year potentially on the early years alone and um, if it were to be invested it's been endorsed by the executive so it's going to be a high high profile piece of work that has potential to be transformational for children in those very, very early years. And I think your work can influence it, so. Okay, that's that's really yes. helpful that's to really hear. Helpful. And apologies for uh, the dropout there, the, the brief dropout there, uh, that small technical hitch. Um, I wanted to pick up on a couple of the other themes that have uh, emerged uh, in the discussions so far and um, I wanted to come back to the point about intervening early and very briefly um, just to hear from, from the panel about how we can ensure that 
we are intervening early. Paul, I, I acknowledge that you've already talked about the important role of Sure Start and uh, getting ready for baby, getting ready for toddler, getting ready to learn. But when families um, put their hands up and need help, I think the experience of the program indicates that they, they sometimes do that at a, a stage where there's an even greater crisis. So how can we be enabling um, early intervention um, Mark, I might come to you first on this and also then De, De Moira. And then once we've explored this issue, I'm going to come back and then talk about how we fund for outcomes and fund flexibly. So interested to pick up these two issues before we finish. So Mark. Yeah, just, just to kick us off, um, I have often wondered at what point mm. is it the best point to offer support? Um, I've been involved in meetings where I've suggested offering support um, with relationships at the point where we encounter the family most when they're having their first child. I've been told on numerous occasions, don't tell people they might end up getting divorced at one of the happiest points of their life. So I think you do need to strike the balance. Having said that, I was also struck earlier by the message from the parent, we should have been given this from the start and we shouldn't have had to go looking for it. I think there's something to be said for having all of the information that you need to navigate various different family challenges in one place and everybody knowing where that is. So before I came into my post, I didn't know anything about the Family Support NI website. Um, I gather people now who know about it don't even associate it with childcare, which is on there as well. You can find any, any childcare provider, you can find any family support, um, which is in your area. So things like that, I think we need to make much more of and try to make things easy for parents. Um, as I say, whenever you have a baby, we see those parents numerous times through hospital appointments, through midwifery appointments and um, health visitor appointments. I think those are opportunities to at least make people aware that there are support services out there, preferably in one easy to locate place. Um, and if they need to call on them, then they already know um, that there's somewhere they can go. Mark, one of the things that we're hearing from projects is that because of scarcity of statutory funding, that sometimes this, even the statutory funder has, has withdrawn or sh shrunk back the, the, the services that they have provided. So that, that gap that we were talking about earlier has in some cases widened. Um, and that is causing a challenge, I think, for the community and voluntary sector um, in responding. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, we've had some good um, discussions both um, through the main event today and in the breakout session about the nature of funding and how that constrains the, statu the statutory sector. If I could change one thing, it would be the fact that I can only commission things for one year at a time. Um, yeah. I don't know how you can invest in long-term positive outcomes on that basis. That's one of the strengths of this program. Um, so there are things that we're not going to be able to solve um, here and now. I just, as I look to the future and I see a budget for 22 to 25, um, I hope that gives us the flexibility we need to be able to, yes, deal with people when they're at crisis point, but also make sure we're investing for that future saving to, to support people to stay out of the system as long as we possibly can. Moira, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this as well. How we, how we keep it early intervention, early intervention, and don't let it drift into crisis support. So... I, I suppose, Magella, from, from my point of view, um, unlike other colleagues on the call, I'm not an expert on early intervention. I think that's an important point to make in that where you're not the expert, you ought to be seeking it out. So mm -hmm. I'll, just, I'll just park that as a, as a, as a, general, as a, a general point. Um, however, my, my past experience um, within, um, I spent a lot of my career in the justice sector, and my past experience there, points very, very strongly to, um, you know, the first, uh, the first five years of a person's life being the most important up to the age of four. So the early intervention piece is, is, beyond, is beyond certainly um, some of what we would describe as early intervention. It's actually, you know, we need to have our, our concepts right on that. So from, from my point of view, and 
certainly within this role. So our, my role at the minute, I'm the strategic partner for the voluntary and community sector within government, I think is probably the, the easiest way to describe it. So we have a responsibility around that strategic government relationship with the sector, but also we're um, a very significant funder. And a lot of our funding would be in the space of um, it, it, it starts to get into the areas that other colleagues uh, in other government departments that are perhaps more clearly associated with. So a number of colleagues in the room will be aware we fund neighbourhood renewal partnerships, which deal with a whole whole range of issues uh, within our, our most deprived communities. And I think our job ought to be, uh, in my view, our job is about creating an enabling environment and about removing barriers to allow those who are most expert and are closest to the issues um, to deal with them. And I think that's where we in government can add the most value. And I think to your point earlier around, you know, our certainly our learning over the last um, the last two years is that each, each partner um, should do what only they can do. So play to strengths. And um, that was something that, that we learned very early on that I think, again, when we're talking about what do we now mainstream, I think that's something that we absolutely need to mainstream. And early intervention, the, the, the evidence is there, that's what works. Um, and we then need to build a system around that rather than look at the existing system and say, well, how do we, how do we shoehorn things into this? So early intervention, the fact that that is, that is the, the, the evidence-based way to fund, but how do we then bend the spend so that there is investment at the point where it is most needed and where we know it will actually have the most impact and have that upstream attitude, but also long-term because we, we hear it over and over again that the starvation cycle of annual funding um, is actually counterproductive and can, and can undermine, but in some cases people have said to us, we'd be better off doing nothing and doing something for 12 months, having a cliff edge, putting people on protective notice, not being able to give uh, families and communities um, assurance that this support will continue. So um, certainly this is that's a message that we need to be putting very, very clearly um, to, to ministers and, and to others, particularly as we face into this next mandate, because obviously uh, we have an election coming up next year. And, and I'm sure that colleagues colleagues at the conference this morning will also be making uh, those points to their elected representatives but um, uh, the starvation cycle of, of, of annual budgets um, it, it's very hard to see any uh, any benefits to that to be honest and I'm just going to pivot to that point given that you've raised it and we only have about five minutes left and I'm going to start actually with Sandra Seamus and, and just take a question I put a question to you, Sandra, and then come to you, Seamus, on, on this point. So, Sandra, you have funded for outcomes and you have funded for the long term. What learning is there for wider uh, funders um, from the experience that you've had? What have been the risks and pitfalls and what have been the benefits? OK, thanks, Magella. I suppose um, the biggest learning for us is around flexibility. And I know, uh, you know, I've talked about that a lot already. Um, but listening as well and, and trust has been a huge part of it. Um, and we've always come from the mindset that, you know, if you put people in the lead, communities will thrive. And we really believe that we need to listen to the, our grant holders and trust them because they know better about the communities that they're working with. They know about the families and what the needs are. Um, so we needed to listen to them and be flexible in terms of trusting them to do what they felt was right in terms of the, the areas of work that they work in. I suppose for us, it's been really, really important over uh, last year in terms of COVID, because projects have had to adapt very quickly. And we've been so impressed at how the sector has completely adapted and really risen to the challenge, I suppose, of the adversities that they faced. And so that flexibility has been really important. And for us, because some projects have had to completely change how they've worked, they've had to go online, um, they've looked to introduce more practical um, areas of work with families as well. So we've really needed to listen to that and, and be flexible and work with them. Um, so for us, the biggest learning is listening. And I really have to say that. And, and we want to continue to do that, especially for us over the next um, couple of years as we do 
review our portfolio and look at where we are going with our funding programs. We want to build on all of this learning, including what we've heard today and including what we hear from the sector on a daily basis. So and um, the listening and flexibility, Magella, I can't emphasize that enough. Yeah, and I see the audience, Seamus, has picked up on Moira's comment about the starvation cycle of annual budgets. Um, you've been championing funding for outcomes for a long time. Um, I'm interested to hear your comments on, on the point that we're making about the importance of funding for outcomes and how we can help to animate that, that call. Yeah, I think the first thing to say is that, you know, Northern Ireland has been plagued, you know, by five years or more now of annual funding cycles. And we know what caused that in terms of collapse of the executive and its absence, and then the COVID crisis, and then the Treasury moved to, you know, to a one-year funding cycle uh, as well. But it's no way to run anything. It's no way to run a voluntary organisation, never mind run uh, the government and run Northern Ireland. So it's imperative that we get back to longer funding cycles to allow proper planning. And the proper use of money, money is wasted when it's not planned for uh, properly. On the outcome issue, what, what has always gone against it is, uh, I, I suppose, the accountability questions. You know, how do we, how do we know uh, what's been done, what's been achieved and, and all of that? And even if the outcomes are good, how do we know that what the money was put to caused that to happen? So we've got to change that. And I think that's where ministers and senior civil servants, permanent secretaries, head of the civil service, when they started to take the new approach to a draft programme for government to shift it to outcomes, that is really, really important. And when we talk about trust, trust isn't a free pass. It's not like, you know, carry on, do whatever you want, you know. Maura placed a lot of trust in people, I can tell you, and she took a lot of risk compared to the way things used to be. Now, I think that has definitely paid off and that will be commended in, in the future. And the bigger risk in a crisis is actually behaving very slow and not taking risks and things like that. That's very obvious. It's how we translate that back into a more peacetime environment becomes uh, the issue. So my hope and expectation is that a program for government that focuses on outcomes begins to drive it. And I wouldn't fund anything that doesn't deliver well for the, its beneficiaries. Because to do that, if you keep doing things that you always did that are of no value, uh, doesn't help the beneficiaries, it's the beneficiaries that are really getting harmed. So there's a public duty uh, on the public sector and on the voluntary and community sector to make the best of the pound wherever it comes from. So focusing on the outcomes, uh, you know, is, is definitely it. And find ways to measure that. And then my other big hope was I didn't really mind where the program for government started. My hope was in two years time, when we begin to identify the things that aren't working, how then you start to shift money towards things that might. And you have to take risks at that point because if you're absolutely sure an intervention is gonna work, it's probably not much of an intervention. You know, there, there are some risks that need to be taken. And as I say, what we learned as well in the, in the, in the pandemic was, and if some of those things aren't going to work, fine, stop it, move on and do something else. So I think we have to keep at it, Magella. That, that, that is the thing. And we've got to focus on this out, outcomes all the time. So I'm, I'm going to actually draw the panel to a close now. We're, we're actually bang on time. And um, I want to thank Sandra, Seamus, Moira, Mark and Paul for um, taking the time to be with us all morning and for your comments today. Um, we are going to be um, working as part of our role with the National Lottery um, Reaching Out Supporting Families Programme to disseminate the learning from today. We have a number of other learning papers that we will be issuing and we look forward to working with um, the departments and indeed with you, Seamus, as well, in taking forward the learning, which has relevance, I think, for a number of different strands of work. Um, but thank you very much to you for coming along today. It was an excellent panel discussion. Um, so, and my job now is to actually to close the conference. And um, 
I want to um, do so by, first of all, thanking all of you who've made time this morning to come along and listen. We've had um, uh, attendees from all over the island of Ireland, from Cork I've seen and Donegal, but also from further afield as well. I spotted uh, people from York and, and elsewhere um, attending today. So thank you very much, everyone who's made time. I want to say a particular thank you to um, our colleagues in the National Lottery for the six years of partnership and the very strong and flexible um, outcomes focused relationship that we've had with you. We've really appreciated that. So thank you very much um, for, for the opportunity to work with you and on this program. I want to say a very strong word of thanks to the grant holders this is a very significant closing milestone for us in our work with you. And we have developed a very strong relationship with you, as I think you know, and vice versa. And it's going to, it's going to be tough to say goodbye to you when we get to that point. And we transition then into a new phase of sharing the learning from the programme. But I just want to thank you very much for your partnership, the work that you do with communities, and um, there are communities too. So thank you very much um, for everything that you have done. And um, I want to thank all our speakers today, um, including Minister Kearney and Minister, Minister Middleton, um, our, everyone who's come along today, including the panelists. And I finally want to say a, a word of thanks to my colleagues in CES. Earlier today, I name checked Melanie, who is the lead for this project, Jennifer, Mark O'Kane, who's been behind the scenes and who's a project support with us, Dervla, Katrina, who did all the animations, Neve, who's moderated, but who's provided really expert knowledge and comms right throughout, Claire Hickey, who's our evaluations specialist, Kerry, our intern, and the wider CS team. But I wanna make a special mention of a colleague who's actually leaving us today, and who worked on this project as a graduate intern um, many years ago and who's been with us as a project specialist. We've been sharing her with Stram Millis, um, where she's an early years expert lecturer and she's going back to Stram Millis. So Suzanne McCartney, we wish you, we send you off with our love and we, we, we wish you very well. So there's a small, um, survey we'd love you to complete it's in the chat um, we are very focused on getting your feedback on how you find the conference today we will be in touch and all the resources that you find today are on our website um, and thank you very much everyone all the best We'll keep we'll keep the um the channel open while you access that link. <laughs>